My next guest is Jay Matik. Jay is a veteran education and accomplished author, having co-written 18 books, including the award-winning and best-selling Understanding by Design series with Grant Wiggins. His books have been translated into 14 languages. Jay has also written more than 50 chapters, articles, and blogs, and been published in the leading journals, including Educational Leadership, ASCD, Edutopia, and Education Week. Jay has an extensive background in professional development and is a regular speaker at state, national, and international conferences. He has made presentations in 47 states within the U.S., in seven Canadian provinces, and internationally in 38 countries on six continents. Welcome to the podcast, Jay. Uh, thanks, Dana. Good to be with you. Tell me about a time when you were in the trenches and managed to crawl out. Well, there are probably quite a few trenches I could I could cite, but I'll give you one experience that was kind of an aha for me as a student. And this was when I was in college as an undergraduate, and I believe, it, or no, it was sophomore year, and I was in a liberal arts school, uh, College of William and Mary in Virginia, to, uh, to be a, more specific. And I remember that year, I had three of my five classes one semester. One was English literature or literature of, of England and Britain, British literature. One was uh, world history, and the other was uh, a history of art. Art They called it art in the dark because we looked at slides in a dark room. And somewhere in that semester, there was an there was a connection that I made between the history of the times, the literature, the British literature, and the art. And it was literally an aha for me because you know, probably because I just wasn't capable of it, but also because it was never done by design. What did I ever make interdisciplinary connections? And that was the first time as a student that I had this, wow, that's really interesting. I can see how the history influenced the literature and the art, but the art was also representation of things that were going on at the time. I wonder if that happens today. And, you know, I began to think about things that were were connected. Um, and so I never forgot that. And then as a teacher, I taught upper elementary to start in part because I wanted to teach different things and I wanted to help kids see connections. So th that experience as a, as a college student in some ways informed my teaching and my thinking about the nature of knowledge and, and disciplines, both particular, but also how they do connect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and having that experience as a college student um, and, and doing kind of that cross-curricular uh, dive into content, um, and, and it, was that kind of on your own or was that how the teacher, the professor uh, kind of led you to that history? It was completely not by design. Okay. I, I don't believe any of the professors from those three courses talked to each other. It was an aha that I made, but it was only yeah. because it was serendipitous rather than purposeful. And, and so the implication is because the world outside of school often is integrative, real issues and problems don't fall neatly into subject area silos. And we want students to recognize that there are rich and important connections across disciplines. I think we need to, to be mindful of, of that reality and, and help students see those connections where they're appropriate without forcing them. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a great, um just example of how, you know, people can find that on their own, but, you know, as teachers uh, to uh, help kids uh, discover, especially at the lower grades that uh, you taught at. Um, so um, after you've been teaching um, in schools, what got you into starting to writing, starting to write about understanding by design? Well, I had, I had, as my career unfolded, I had done a little bit of writing, mostly people asked me to write about something that I had presented on in a workshop or, mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and so I'd written a couple of articles uh, and I had actually written a short book on assessment. Um, during that era, I was working at the Maryland State Department of Education. This was mm -hmm. in the late eighties and early nineties. And it was at the start of the standards-based movement in the US. Um, and I was placed on a team, one of five people charged with 
developing and implementing Maryland standards-based reform in the, in the mm -hmm. early 90s. And part of that reform was, was somewhat unique in that we decided in Maryland to, to try to make a major shift in our state assessment system from multiple choice test items to performance-based assessments. Mm -hmm. And we were one of the a few states that had moved in that direction. And in, in conjunction with that effort, we uh, brought in a couple of consultants, including Grant Wiggins, who at the time was working with Ted Sizer and the Coalition of Essential Schools, and they were advocating the use of authentic performance-based assessments. Mm -hmm. So we got, I, got, I met, got to meet Grant at that time. Someone at ASCD, the educational organization, um, had us to a dinner meeting together and, and proposed that we collaborate on a book assuming it was going to be on assessment because that's what we were mm -hmm. both working on. But when I met with Grant the next morning after the dinner and asked him what he thought, he said, well, I would be interested in co-authoring a book, but I want it to be more than just about assessment. He said, my doctoral work at Harvard was on curriculum. Mm -hmm. And I said, and I, my um, emphasis has always been on engaging teaching strategies, teaching for active meaning making and so on. So mm -hmm. I would want a book that incorporates that. So that was the genesis of understanding by design. At that breakfast meeting, we kind of carved out the the, the initial conception of UBD. Mm -hmm. um, so that was back um, the early '90s. I know one of your books, uh, first books, were published at the in the late '90s. So was that over a period of time that you kind of planned out the UBD process? Yes, understanding by design was published first in 1997. Okay. Um, and for schools that don't currently use Understanding by Design, um, why should they discover it? What would they be missing if they don't currently use that process? Well, let me throw out, not throw out, let, let me respond with some questions that mm -hmm. I think UBD as a framework can help to answer. Mm -hmm. uh, in no particular order, what's most important for students to really understand in all that we ask them to learn and mm -hmm. why how do we avoid just trying to cover lots of content what does it mean to uncover the content so that students really understand it mm -hmm. are we assessing everything we claim to value or primarily the things that are easiest to test and grade mm -hmm. when do students get truly engaged in learning versus just going through the motions or being minimally compliant. Mm -hmm. um, how do we teach in ways that yield deep lasting learning versus superficial knowledge that fades from memory? What does it take to create a guaranteed and viable curriculum that's coherent and aligned across the grades? And how do we do that by design? These are the questions that understanding by design addresses. And so to your question more pointedly, any teacher, school, or district that's interested in deep learning, engaging students in more authentic applications of learning, um, and wants a curriculum that's coordinated within and across subjects, should look at understanding by design as a framework to help achieve those goals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I I've th thought of places that I've worked that have some of those aspects. Um, you know, they do want uh, that guaranteed and viable curriculum. For example, um, they want um, engaged students, but um, you know, they might not necessarily be following all the areas of this process. Um, and I know you've put out several books on the uh, process. Um, more, a lot of them were in conjunction with Grant Wiggins, correct? Uh, that's right. We co-wrote a whole series of books for, uh, around the UBD framework. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So your your latest book is assessing uh, student learning by design. Um, so how can we help teachers use classroom assessments to gather appropriate evidence for all value learning goals and to use those assessments, not just to measure learning, but to promote it? Yeah, well, the book begins with a set of underlying principles about effective classroom assessment. One of those is that our contention, and my, my co-author Steve Ferrara and I wrote this book, our contention is the primary purpose of classroom assessments should be to enhance learning and 
to support better teaching mm -hmm. resources, evaluation and grading among them. But we, we recommend that those secondary purposes don't undercut the first. Uh, but then the question becomes, so what does that mean? Well, one, thing's, one thing it means to our goals. And because we have different types of educational goals, in fact, you can unpack standards documents and you'll see factual knowledge that kids should know. You'll see more abstract concepts that you want students to understand. You have skills and processes reflecting what you want students to be able to do. And you might even have dispositions or habits of mind. So for in instance, you see in the math standards, uh, we want students to persevere when they're struggling with, with tough problems. Or in science, to be open to data to inform our opinions. Um, those are habits of mind. And so good assessment is derived from the goals. And so a fundamental principle is we wanna have assessment evidence that's appropriate and matched to our goals. That leads then to the recognition that we need to use different forms or types of assessment to get evidence according to those goals. If I wanna see if Jay knows X, Y, or Z, an objective test or quiz with a single correct answer will tell me that. Um, and we can use multiple choice short answer formats that are common. But if I wanna see if student, if Jay understands an abstract concept and can apply it effectively or can apply a process um, a, a well and uh, appropriately, I think that in general, we need more performance type assessments. Um, and so it's not either or. Yeah. The, the assessment should give us the right evidence given our goals. Um, a third principle of classroom assessment is it should be fair. Mm -hmm. um, and so to me, that translates into a couple of things. One of which is we should allow as much as possible students to show their learning in ways that work for them. In other words, unlike standardized tests that, that have to be standardized for certain technical reasons, classroom assessments can be more open. And for instance, if we wanna see if student un students understand a science concept, we might give them a traditional test, but we might also ask them to explain it orally or even visually. Can you represent this concept uh, and show us that you understand it that way? And for a student who may be dysgraphic or not an English speaker, some of those other formats other than writing um, would be legitimate and we mm -hmm. should allow that. So um, those are some of the underlying principles. In our book, we actually have a framework that looks at the goals we're assessing, the purposes for assessment, and the audiences who's going to get and use that information. And the answer to those three sets of questions leads to an array of assessment methods. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everything from selected response, like matching, true, false, multiple choice, short constructive response, more open performance assessments, and even what we call process-focused assessments. Point being, your choice of assessment methods needs to be based on what you're assessing, for what purpose, and for whom. Mm -hmm. um, and we also discuss different ways of evaluation and communication of results. Now, one other point, if I may, going back to the first principle, that if we contend or agree that the fundamental purpose of classroom assessment should be to inform teaching and, and deepen and, and promote learning. Then mm -hmm. this underscores the fact that our assessment should be more than something we do at the end of teaching segments to get a grade. Mm -hmm. If you want assessment to inform teaching and, and improve learning, there are two other purposes and types. Mm -hmm. One, often called diagnostic or pre-assessment, uh, is used at the start of a new body of, of teaching, maybe a new unit or even the beginning of a new course, where we wanna find out through assessment what students know or think they know about this given topic. And also if it's skill-based teaching, what's their skill level at the start? Mm -hmm. People who work with extracurricular activities do this naturally. Coaches have tryouts and, yeah. and so do drama instructors. You got to find out where your players or your or your thespians are, 
Mm-hmm. And, and then you can plan your teaching. And in some cases, that informs differentiated instruction. If some kids already have the skills and some are lacking them, you, you, you want to accommodate those differences. Mm-hmm. Um, so diagnostic pre-assessments are important to teaching and learning, as are formative or ongoing assessments. Mm-hmm. To me, the best way of improving learning and Dylan Williams and his colleague uh, in London, uh, Paul Black, have done seminal research highlighting the, the critical value of formative assessment. And formative assessment is purpose is to quote, inform. Mm-hmm. It's not to evaluate, it's not to grade, it's to inform teachers about what's working and what they need to adjust and to inform students about how they're doing and giving them feedback so they can improve. Mm-hmm. Here's an analogy I'm fond of. And let's let's go back to extracurriculars. Think about athletics, team sports, or theater or in drama. Mm-hmm. We would never, or I don't think any effective coach or sponsor would have in practice just go through the playbook play by play, or in theater, have kids memorize their lines. But then the first time they played the game or saw the stage was a hunt game day or opening night, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. What do coaches do and sponsors do, uh, theater directors, to prepare? They have scrimmages and dress mm-hmm. rehearsals. Mm-hmm. Those are formative assessments with feedback because that's what's needed. Just covering requisite knowledge and skills is insufficient preparation for authentic performance. You need ongoing feedback, not on individual skills only, but on can you put it all together in the game or in the play. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if we want classroom assessments to support learning, we have to do a good job with formative ongoing assessments, not just end of teaching a summative evaluations. Mm Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You also talked to me in the pre-chat how um, UBD is a standards-based planning framework, um, but there are too many grade level standards. Um, so your argument you talked about is unpacking the standards to find out which ones are most impactful. I think a lot of teachers get caught up in trying to cover all of them, um, especially if they're you know teaching towards an assessment, whether it's state or you know a uh, type of um, college interest exam. So what would you advise uh, educators who are kind of uh, really uh, trying to cover those standards? Yeah, well, well, it's a very real tension and I don't want to minimize the challenge, but I Mm -hmm. will say, I'll say a couple of things. Uh, First, my longtime friend and colleague, Bob Marzano was the one who Mm -hmm. came up with a guaranteed and viable curriculum. And it was based on his meta analysis of research that underscored the importance of a coherent guaranteed curriculum. But his Mm -hmm. use of the word viable in that phrase Mm -hmm. was purposeful because his analysis of standards over the the decades points out that which every teacher knows. There's typically too much content in grade level standards and not enough time to teach all that content well. These days, that challenge is exacerbated by the quote learning loss that many students experienced during two years of pandemic. So some kids are notably behind where the grade level standards expect them to be. So that's even more challenging. And so Marzano concluded, you can't have a viable curriculum if there's too much content and not enough time. Now, even even, let's take learning loss out of the, the picture, even given the challenge of covering most of the grade level standards, well, you can do that by talking faster in class, right? You can get, if you want to cover stuff, just talk faster in class and don't have kids do anything except take notes. <laughs> but, that's, but that doesn't support deep, meaningful learning because we know yeah. that for learning that sticks, the students have to be engaged intellectually, actively. They have to mm-hmm. what I call mm-hmm. meaning. And that means you inherently have to be able to prioritize the content so you're not stuck in this coverage frenzy. So the approach that Grant Wiggins and I've taken for many years is to say, think carefully about, number one, what you want students to be able to do with their learning. Mm-hmm. And we call that your transfer goal. And when I say do with your learning, can you, can you apply your learning to something new? Not just mm-hmm. give it back, like I was told to you, but can you actually use it in a meaningful mm-hmm. way? Secondly, 
what are the big ideas that are most worth understanding in this content? Because mm -hmm. again, you get lost in the weeds of trying to cover factlets, but that's not um, that's not going to be helpful. Um, so thinking about the quote big ideas because there are a smaller number of those, but those are powerful. Those help students mm -hmm. make sense of the details, and those are transferable concepts that can be applied in other places within the curriculum, in some cases across curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, and thirdly, we recommend using what we've called essential questions to frame and focus the content around big ideas and, and hopefully questions that will engage student thinking uh, and meaning making. Now, one last point on this. People will say, yeah, Jay, that's all well and good, but we've got state tests in Maryland yeah. or in Missouri. Yeah. Or in, uh, and so my, my question back is, so what are the most widely missed test items on state tests and national tests like NAEP, mm -hmm. National Assessment of Education and Progress? Look it up. If, if your state publishes test score data, you can see find it online. Yeah. And the NAEP results have the same pattern. Most widely missed items are not items of facts, factual knowledge, or mm -hmm. basic skills. They are items that require higher levels. If you're familiar with the depth of knowledge scale, they're level three, not mm -hmm. level one of DOK. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. require reasoning in mathematics, inference and interpretation and reading. And, and so the notion that we have to cover everything in case it's on the test. And if we don't cover everything, the scores might drop, mm -hmm. I think is an untested and, and not, not solid assertion. Mm -hmm. I would rather, and, and my argument is, the best test prep is focusing on the big ideas and the key skills and processes and giving kids lots of experience trying to apply those to new situations. Mm -hmm. if, if you're teaching for understanding and transfer, um, that to me is the best test prep. Now, of course, mm -hmm. we're going to give kids some practice in multiple choice. Uh, we're going to use that format and we're going to give them practice in test taking skills. But that's different than saying we're going to do a test prep curriculum. Everything's going to be multiple choice. And we're just going to try to cover a lot of stuff and hope it sticks. Mm -hmm. Not an effective mm -hmm. strategy, in my view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like you said, thinking about those things, what they can do with their learning, uh, the big ideas you want students to know and the essential questions uh, will guide people in knowing what they should cover in the standards, right? It's not all about, you know, trying to hit all of those targets. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about uh, your transition from um, working for the uh, Department of Education to becoming a full-time speaker. Uh, when did you do, uh, transition and what do you miss the most about working with schools and districts? Um, just kind of in that uh, context, now you're being hired as a consultant. Well, I, I have a long career. This is my 51st year. So mm -hmm. literally half my career, 25 years, was working at the school level, yeah. district, district level in a large district, state level, mm -hmm. coordinated a state governor's school program for gifted students, and I worked with a Maryland Assessment Consortium. That was 25 years. When Understanding by Design was published, and Grant Wiggins and I didn't know if anyone would read it, but in fact, they did. And I started getting calls for presentations and conference speaking. Um, and I had a full-time job. So I, I took an early retirement. And then the, the, the second half of my career, 26 years now, has mm -hmm. been writing and consulting. So uh, to your question, literally, I'm still working with schools and districts. And I'm working with ones that want to work with UBD. So I, I'm, I'm fortunate that I get to work with interesting often progressive educators who recognize the importance of, of sound curriculum and assessment systems. Having said that, what do I miss? Um, sometimes I miss the kids, not every day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, miss, I miss some of the colleagues I had, both at the school, mm -hmm. district, and state levels. Uh, but I, I'll tell you one thing I don't miss. I don't miss having to go to meetings I don't want to go to. <laughs> <laughs> I, especially when I got out of the classroom into more administrative roles, I spent a lot of time in meetings um, and not all of those are, are best use of time. So I, I don't miss that. 
Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm surprised to hear it's been pretty much half your career that you've been working on consulting. It kind of makes sense with the publication of UBD. But, um, you know, you've had both both sides kind of of the coin. And, you know, we hope you continue um, just helping schools out with implementing uh, the processes. Well, out of everything we talked about on the podcast today, what's one thing you'd like listeners to remember? I would summarize it around the concept of deep and engaged learning Mm -hmm. and and both as teachers and parents and even now for me as a grandparent, you know, think about the things that you see in your kids or your students or your grandkids Mm -hmm. when they are most engaged by by what they're doing in school. Um, And and think about what those things are, because Mm -hmm. often there are some identifiable qualities Generally, my experience, what kids are most engaged in is something that's performance based. And often, by the way, when you do student surveys in high schools, kids will cite visual performing arts, career technology type classes and extracurriculars as the most exciting part of their school day. Those are all performance based. Um, Secondly, where the students have some choice about what they're working on or how they show what they know, maybe they get to work in a group. So more Mm -hmm. authentic tasks and projects, um, Mm -hmm. if well structured, are often very engaging. Um, And finally, not just a not just a a teacher who is kind of flamboyant or or creative or or humorous, but a teacher Mm -hmm. that makes them think and and gives them challenging work, but supports them in it. And Mm -hmm. and so to, to summarize, if we want more engaged learning, and learning that is deep and engages students in applying that learning, hence giving them transfer ability. Um, that's the kind of teaching we want. And, and mm. humbly speaking, I'll say that understanding by design is a framework that supports that kind of teaching and learning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Where can people connect with you and find you online? Uh, my website is just my name. So it's literally jmctide.com, one word, or no mm-hmm. space. And I have collected a, a, quite an array of resources, including examples of essential questions, um, a 23-page hot list of hot-linked sources for performance tasks, a 42-page mm-hmm. list of hot links for understanding by design curriculum planning, many articles, podcasts. In fact, I'll, I'll post your podcast when it's available. Uh, so that's one way. And then my Twitter feed is just at Jay McTighe. Um, for several reasons, I've resisted Facebook, so I don't have a Facebook page, so you won't find me there. Mm-hmm. Great. I will make sure to include that in the show notes. Well, thank you so much for being on the Out of the Trenches podcast today. It was a pleasure discussing um, all all, their, all your work and everything that you do to support schools today. Well, thanks, Dana, and it's good being with you also. <laughs>